Hello again, thanks for clicking play and for bringing me onto your screen. It's good to be back with you again. And last time I recorded one of these devotionals, I was looking with you at Proverbs chapter one. We'll just go to right, right to directly to Proverbs chapter two today. And as we do, I want to just make one clarifying remark, and you probably don't need me to tell you this, but just to be sure, as we went through Proverbs 1 yesterday, and as we're going to be going through Proverbs 2 this time, we are only barely scratching the surface of the riches of the content of these chapters. So I don't pretend that uh, this is an exhaustive treatment of, of, of Proverbs. This is just to kind of whet your appetites for further study, for further uh, searching of the scriptures and even study specifically of Proverbs. But as we come to Proverbs chapter 2, um, there are three basic ideas that I want to bring out from it. The first is that wisdom is of infinite value. And we see that suggested to us, proclaimed to us in verses 1 through 7 of Proverbs 2. Here's one of those my son statements that I mentioned last time. My son, if you receive my words and treasure up my commandments with you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding. Yes, if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom, from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk in integrity. And we'll stop right there. I want to bring out uh, the commendation of wisdom to us, we find in these verses. And <clears throat> wisdom is commended in some expressions that are relatively passive, and then some things that are rather uh, actually very active. Uh, first of all, the more passive ones, we're told to take wisdom in. Uh, uses expressions like uh, receive it, treasure it up, be attentive. And that's what we saw in those verses. And then the last expression there, uh, incline your heart, that kind of uh, leans into the more active uh, things that we're going to look at after this. But these, these expressions, receive and treasure up and be attentive, uh, they are teaching us and counseling us to be good students of wisdom, to be good students of God's Word. And there's a contrast that's being drawn for us here between a person who is a good student and someone who's a careless one, a, a diligent and eager student, and one who is uh, negligent. Now, from my experience, I find there are two particular things that lead a student to be diligent and to really earnestly pursue learning. One is that if the subject matter itself is especially interesting to the student. And the other is if the teacher is especially gifted at teaching. Well, I would point out that wisdom is the most important of all subjects that we could possibly study. And the Lord Jesus Christ is the greatest of all teachers. So if we'll submit to the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ and study and pursue wisdom, we have a recipe, we have an environment for, uh, for very uh, diligent and profitable learning. And so we're told here to, to seek it out. Um, <clears throat> we're told to receive it, to treasure it up, and then there's the more active aspect of, of seeking wisdom, of pursuing it, of going after it. The scriptures here say, call out. If you'll call out for wisdom, if you'll raise your voice, if you've ever been out in a in a, a forest somewhere looking for someone who's missing, a, a mom or a dad looking for a missing child. They don't just go quietly looking behind each tree. No, they're crying out. 
They're raising their voice, calling the child's name. And we're told to treat wisdom that way, to look for it with an earnestness and with a, with a sense of urgency. Seek it like silver, is what the scriptures say. Uh, and, and so on and so forth. We're told here to pursue wisdom. You remember not too long ago uh, when the uh, pandemic crisis began, remember how scarce toilet paper was? And you'd go to the store and the shelves were empty, and many of them still are by and large. And you might keep going back to the store over and over, hoping that maybe they'd have a new shipment of toilet paper in. And if they did, people were there and they'd scarf it up and it was all gone in almost no time. Think about the kinds of things that tend to disappear off the shelves of our stores when disaster is coming. Uh, you know quite well about that kind of thing here. Uh, during hurricane season, when people buy up uh, things. Now, if we, if we rightly estimated how precious wisdom is, then we would read and study our Bibles with the same eagerness that people store up bottled water or batteries or other non-perishable food items and things when a hurricane is coming. But that's sort of the, the approach that Scripture encourages us to take towards the study of itself, towards the study of wisdom. Another example, because we don't uh, typically go on treasure hunts, do we? Uh, we don't go seeking for silver. No, but what we do um, is more like on Black Friday, <clears throat> the day after Thanksgiving, when they have all these wonderful sales, all these big doorbuster sales and special items that are being released just in time for the Christmas shopping season, and people will wait in lines, people will get up at the crack of dawn, they'll be get up before the, the dawn of the day to get in line so that they can get the best deals and so they can grab those most sought after items. They want to get it before it sells out and so they'll go to great lengths in many cases. Um, and it's those kind of things that are the modern day equivalent of the California gold rush of uh, 1849 or whenever it was or seeking after treasure. Wisdom ought to be like that for Christians. We ought to pursue wisdom and be and, and have that kind of rapt attentiveness and that kind of zealous pursuit of it. Wisdom is of infinite value. It's more valuable than silver or gold. The second thing we see uh, in chapter 2 of Proverbs is that God, through wisdom, protects our souls. And I tried to word that pretty carefully because the way the passage reads, wisdom is almost personified or wisdom itself is made almost to be the thing that protects us. But we need to remember, and the chapter also does clarify this, that it's God who does the protecting. He's our shield. He's our help. But the instrument by which he protects us is wisdom. He protects us through wisdom from the way of evil, from the way of immorality. So let's look at the passage, verse 8 through 19. Uh, the Lord gives wisdom, from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. And then verse 8 says, guarding the paths of justice and watching over the way of his saints. And if we're seeking wisdom, if we're calling out for it, it says, then you will understand righteousness and justice and equity, every good path. For wisdom will come into your heart, and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. Discretion will watch over you. Understanding will guard you, delivering you from the way of evil, from men of perverted speech who forsake the paths of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness, who rejoice in doing evil and delight in the perverseness of evil, men whose paths are crooked and whose, who are devious in their ways. So you will be delivered from the forbidden woman, from the adulteress with her smooth words, who forsakes the companion of her youth and forgets the covenant of her God. For her house sinks down to death and her paths to the departed. None who go to her come back, nor do they regain the paths of life. So we're told that 
God, through wisdom, protects us from the way of evil. Verse 7, the second half says, He, God, is a shield to those who walk in integrity. It says that discretion and understanding will deliver you from the way of evil. Verse 12. Now remember back in chapter 1, uh, there was the caution against being enticed by sinners to go in the way of sinners. And here, in chapter 2, wisdom is commended as the instrument by which the Lord delivers his people. By wisdom, God delivers his people from men of perverted speech, from those who forsake the paths of uprightness and instead walk in the ways of darkness. God delivers his people from those who rejoice in doing evil and who delight in the perverseness of evil. God, through wisdom, delivers his people from paths that are crooked and ways that are devious. So he delivers us through wisdom from the way of evil. And the way, I, what I'm, the way I'm putting it now is um, he also delivers us from immorality. Now, why am I making a distinction? Because certainly uh, evil is immoral and immorality is evil. But I think uh, in context, especially when we get to uh, verse 16, it's a sexual sort of immorality and infidelity that's specifically in mind here. And it's worth noticing, and I think it's important to, uh, to take account of the fact that in Proverbs 2 through 9, those, those the first one-third or so of the book of Proverbs, there are five extended discourses on the danger of immorality of this kind. So in verse 16, it says that by wisdom you will be delivered from the forbidden woman, from the adulteress. And we're told, we're warned, uh, that she speaks persuasively and with her persuasive speech she entices uh, with her smooth words the text says um, and although her words may be smooth uh, we're told that her house sinks down to death and her paths to the departed in verse 18 now here when it says house when it says her house sinks down to death that's a reference to her and to those who commit immorality with her. So verse 19 says, None who go to her come back, nor do they regain the paths of life. Very strong warning, a very urgent warning. But we see in, in that passage that through wisdom, God protects our souls. But then finally, in these last three verses of the chapter, we're told that the fruit of wisdom is life, and the fruit of wickedness is destruction. That antithesis uh, that we find in these last couple of verses is embodied in Psalm 1. And it's expressed numerous ways in Proverbs as well. But in Psalm 1, the, the opening verse says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, and it goes on to describe this man as the one who delights in the way of the Lord, in the law of the Lord. Verse 4 of Psalm 1 says, The wicked are not so, for they are like the chaff that the wind drives away. Now, our manner of life, uh, any person's, any given person's heart priorities are re repeatedly expressed or described as paths or ways. So when we come to verse 20, uh, we're told that so, in other words, through wisdom, you will walk in the way that is good and keep to the paths of righteousness. Verse 21, for the upright will inhabit the land and those with integrity will remain in it. Inhabiting the land and remaining in it are biblical shorthand for eternal life. Verse 22 says, But the wicked will be cut off from the land, and the treacherous will be rooted out of it. And of course, if 
inhabiting the land and remaining in it are shorthand for eternal life than uh, being cut off and being rooted out as shorthand for eternal destruction and damnation. So if you look then and take verses 21 and 22 together, they form, as the two verses, an antithetical parallelism. The wise inhabit the land and remain. The wicked will be cut off from the land and rooted out. And that antithesis, um, made up of two mutually exclusive alternatives, comes out finally in the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ. At the end of the Sermon on the Mount, he tells the story of two different men, one who builds his house on the rock, and he's wise, one who is foolish and builds his house on the sand. He tells a parable about a good tree, how it bears good fruit, and conversely, the bad tree bears bad fruit. He tells a parable of a field that's sown with good seed. He sowed, the farmer sowed wheat, but the enemy came and sowed weeds. You got the wheat and you got the tares. You got the parable of the ten virgins. Five of them were wise, five of them were foolish. And then it culminates uh, with Jesus' own teaching about the Day of Judgment. It's an awesome passage in Matthew 25 starting with verse 31 where he says when the son of man comes in his glory and all the angels with him then he will sit on his glorious throne before him will be gathered all the nations and he will separate people from one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats and he will place the sheep on his right but the goats on his left there are many so-called paths a person can take in life. But as it pertains to eternity, there are only two. The fear of the Lord, which leads to life, and the rejection of the Lord, which leads to destruction. So carefully choose which path you're going to take. We're all called to do that, and Scripture uh, counsels us to do that. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you that you share your wisdom with us, that you store it up for us in your word. So help us eagerly and with uh, great earnest to study and search the scriptures. Lord, protect our souls as we, by your grace, apply wisdom in our lives. Protect us from the way of evil. Protect us from immorality. And Lord, help give us the grace to refuse the evil, refuse wickedness, turn away from the path of destruction, and find life in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. This we pray in his name. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.